I, it's so exciting to have uh, all of you here and to have such amazing panelists to speak on uh, these important topics. Uh, we are, I wanted to begin by acknowledging uh, the land where we, where we are. Um, of course, this is a virtual uh, event. So wherever you are, I encourage you to take a moment to just acknowledge uh, the land that you are currently working, living on, and the peoples who occupied, lived, and worked in these lands for, uh, for uh, uh, generations uh, before you. Um, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, we're going to begin with some opening remarks from a principal of Massey College, Natalie de Rosier. Uh, principal de Rosier studied law at Université de Montréal and Harvard University. She has served as the Dean of Civil Law at the University of Ottawa, General Counsel to the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, MPP of Ottawa Vanier Riding, and on Kathleen Wynne's cabinet as Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, it is such a pleasure to have her give opening remarks, and a few of the panelists on today are members of the Massey community, so it's just, it's, it's wonderful to have uh, uh, Natalie give some opening remarks. Natalie, please take it away. Oh, Natalie, you are on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me uh, he, to say a few words at this solution summit. Um, as uh, Phil said, uh, I'm so glad to be here because many members of the Massey community are on this panel. And first I want to say uh, one of the objective of the Massey uh, College is to instill in its uh, young fabulous scholars, one of them was Phil, uh, the sense of public purpose that they must have. And you would know that running for elections is a great service to one's society. So I want to congratulate him on making this commitment on behalf of all of us. And I'm also very happy that he's drawn on other Massey resources, alumni Victoria Reedman and a senior fellow Diane Sachs. So this solution summit uh, is about uh, three topics, uh, green jobs, housing affordability, and the rights and protection for essential workers. I think all three of them deserve our attention and all three of them I think raise a, a host of different issues. Let me just tackle very briefly uh, the green jobs aspect of it. So I was uh, thinking about what I was going to say today during the weekend and reflected a very interesting um, headlines in the New York Times on Sunday where they describe the green jobs not simply as good jobs but potentially as gig jobs. So the point of the article was that green jobs uh, may not have as much social justice uh, implications because they may be uh, built in a context of either anti-unions activities and so on. That may be in the States, but I was challenged, I think, in my own viewpoint about saying, it's not enough to be green. You have to be uh, also having a green agenda with a social justice. So we know that green jobs are not just a nice thing to do, but also are the way of the future that they already are part of our economy and have been so for several decades. So in a way, uh, the real innovation here is not whether there will be green jobs, but how much and how transformative the green jobs will be uh, in replacing the old industrial jobs. And in doing so, I think we would want to make sure that it continues to have a social justice aspect to it. And I'm sure that Phil's involvement will be on that score uh, as well. And my final point, I think, is to uh, link uh, the green jobs with housing affordability and the protection of essential workers. I think it's incumbent of, on us to recognize the big divides that uh, we've experienced to the pandemic, how poor people, vulnerable people just, just were hit so much more dramatically. So I think it has exposed deep flaws in our societies that need to be confronted right now. We cannot afford and we should not tolerate that uh, inequalities are further 
expanded at a time where we are moving and trying to build a better society. So I want to commend all the three speakers for being here and invite them to continue to participate uh, in public discussions at Massey and throughout the world. So, uh, and thank you again for inviting me, Phil. Thank you so much. Those were such a wonderful way to start off this event. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more, the intertwining of social justice, climate justice, economic opportunity, housing affordability, essential work. It, these are not different uh, topics that are in silos, they're all connected. And I think today we'll see with our panelists and the questions that uh, arise, how they are connected. So first I'd like to uh, introduce our first panelist, uh, Helen Watts. Helen is Student Energy's Senior Director of Global Partnerships, leading collaborations with public, private, and civil society organizations and advocating for meaningful youth inclusion in decision-making. Helen was a lead designer and implementer of Greenpreneurs, an entrepreneurship accelerator program for youth in the global south, co-led by Student Energy, Youth Climate Lab, and the Global Green Growth Institute. Helen has spoken at forums around the world to advocate for the value of youth and to raise global ambition on climate and energy action. She's published works for the 2016 World Social Forum and is one of Canada's 2018 top 25 environmentalists under 25. It's such a pleasure to have you here, Helen. Thank you for joining us. And I, I'd like to start, I'm gonna ask every panelist the same question, um, which is, in your opinion, what are the most impactful things that the federal government can do tomorrow to improve the situation of youth in, in green jobs and to prepare us for that future? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Phil, for having me here. And thank you so much to the fellow panelists and to the audience as well. Really looking forward to this discussion today. Um, so as Phil mentioned, I have a lot of experience kind of on the clean energy side of um, climate action. But of course, that intersects with all different dimensions of um, climate, green jobs, justice. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do is, is very intersecting. Um, Maybe to quickly set the stage, and I know this, a lot of these stats might not be might not be new to all of you, but um, I was reading a recent article about uh, the growth of Canada's environmental workforce or green workforce, um, and we're on this really consistent trajectory of growth right now in terms of um, new job creation for young people and existing workers to move into these kind of termed green jobs. Um, that's really exciting. It's also um, a little bit scary when you think about how quickly curriculums are adapting or how organizations are supported to be able to kind of fill in the gaps with those kind of green skills that young people need to succeed um, in the future of work. Um, and even beyond green jobs specifically, kind of those critical skill sets that young people need to succeed in the future of work um, more broadly um, is, is quite, a, quite a challenging area to dig into and involves a lot of um, practical and future ready um, skill building opportunities. So I would say kind of my first big policy would be around supporting that capacity building side. And I think it's a combination of working with um, universities and colleges um, and academic institutions to work with them on integrating um, green green skill building um, and, and climate capacity building within curriculums and across different disciplines as well. That's hugely, hugely important. It's not just um, it's not just a topic for, you know, environmental scientists to learn about. It's something that should be embedded in every single discipline. Um, and then on the other side, you know, also working with organizations who have a lot of trust in different communities and who are working on capacity building in different ways as well. Um, you know, we, academia is hugely important to this equation, but young people are also, and community members at large are learning um, a lot from the different communities that they're part of as well. And the different organizations that they participate in either voluntarily or, um, you know, in different capacities. And so um, not just organizations like Student Energy, but, you know, there's there's so many out there that really have a lot of trust in whatever their community might be. And so those are really important spaces to, um, for the federal government and for government to kind of work in partnership with and actively support in a really kind of meaningful and tangible way um, to really ensure that they're well supported to deliver on um, climate and green uh, skill building and capacity building. Um, so that would be the first piece is kind of around education and capacity building. Um, the second piece I would really say is investing, and this is where I think some of the kind of equity and social justice dimensions come in, is investing um, in an inclusive innovation ecosystem um, when it comes to climate, um, climate innovation. Uh, so 
we've seen um, quite a lot of kind of commitments that uh, around kind of investments in R&D that are at quite high levels and those tend to be quite inaccessible um, to young people um, and to marginalized groups that may not have access to the same networks um, and you know breadth of experience that uh, that kind of the usual suspects in the in the field in kind of the clean tech or climate climate space tend to have and so in order to make this a really level playing field um, student energy often calls for much more agile and accessible finance mechanisms for um, young people, for small and medium businesses and entrepreneurs um, working on climate innovation uh, to be able to kind of be well supported to take their innovations further and also creating a really um, connected ecosystem. So whether that's through incubation hubs, the creation of incubation hubs that have proved to be really successful in different locations around the world, um, taking that model and making sure that, that Canada is really investing in this um, really inclusive, um, equity centric uh, innovation ecosystem for everyone to be able to participate in um, in this space. Um, the, the last one that I'll emphasize here is um, inclusion and in policymaking. Um, this is one that I play a lot in the space of uh, is how do we get young people and marginalized communities um, in the door and have a seat at the table to really have not just a voice but active agency in spaces where decisions are being made that will disproportionately impact their future. So as we know, young people are really going to shoulder the burden of um, of climate change and its and its impacts. Um, and so it is it's not just kind of this untapped opportunity, but it's also a, a kind of conversation around the responsibility of including young people um, at the table to have agency. This also means making um, young people kind of running for office and taking on uh, roles in politics more accessible to young people, being able to see mentors like Phil, who's kind of moving into the space um, that we can look up to and kind of see these pathways available to us to participate. Um, but I think what governments can do is, um, I've seen a lot of kind of these, these patterns of consultation processes where, for example, the same young people are invited to the table again and again. And I'll, you know, be the first one to say, like, I tend to be one of these people. And, um, you know, what what we'll often try and do is give up our seat to other young people who haven't been in those in those spaces before. But I do think that, you know, it comes to a point where there is an imperative responsibility as well of government to be actively seeking out um, diverse communities, um, groups of people that are missing from that table, um, and also making sure that, you know, in inviting these new voices to the space. Um, you're creating a really meaningful and accountable process for how you're engaging with them. You're not just kind of inviting them in them in the room, um, picking their brains for ideas or kind of ticking that box of doing a consultation, but you really are working with them to build out what is the follow through mechanism of this process. How are we going to make sure that your um, your ideas and considerations are really you know actively implemented, or if they're not implemented right away, what is the roadmap to getting to a point where they can be implemented? Like, let's just be really transparent about the process because it is, you know, it is challenging sometimes to sign off on doing something right after a consultation process. These things take time, but you can be transparent about that process. You can bring young people into the fold with building that roadmap. Um, so I'd say that's the that's the third piece is inclusive, inclusive policy design, um, inclusive consultation processes that have meaningful follow through um, and compensate youth if they're showing up in these processes as well. That's also how you can make it inclusive. So a lot of young people can't afford to participate in those processes. So make sure that young people are compensated to participate as well. Um, and young people, as we know, really do have these climate forward mindsets. We've done research recently where over 80% of young people um, will vote uh, taking sustainable energy and climate commitments into consideration. Um, so it's really, it's also quite practical, bring them into these spaces, make sure that their values are embedded in um, in these policies that you want to kind of sustain over the long run as well, um, so that they can they can continue and create the impact that you're projecting them to. Um, maybe I'll leave it there. That's a lot of information. Yeah. That was that was amazing. So if I'm going to distill that down, I'll say so: uh, education, flexible financing, inclusivity, uh, and I, I love that. I mean, I think it really it shows not only for for young people but other um, underrepresented groups, right? Like we hear all the time about consultations with indigenous peoples, but how much of that consultation leads to action and how much of it is, is real and true. So um, I'm sure we'll dive into that, uh, into some more questions uh, after we hear from the other panelists on that. And I also encourage, um, you know, the other panelists, if they have questions for each other, because uh, uh, there's so much to uh, inter intersection between these three themes. Um, so, so next, I'm going to introduce our, our next panelist and ask her the same question. Um, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Diane Sachs, uh, the Deputy Leader of the Green Party of Ontario. 
Uh, Diane is an internationally recognized Canadian lawyer rated among the top 25 environmental lawyers in the world. Diane studied law at Osgoode Hall Law School before practicing law with the Ontario government for 14 years, worked in two major law firms and then ran an environmental law boutique firm for 25 years. She was the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario from 2015 to 2019. And as I said, she is currently the Deputy Leader of the Green Party of Ontario, serving alongside Abhijit Manet, who, by the way, I will be doing a Twitch stream later this evening. Um, so I get to, the pleasure of doing an event with both of the Deputy Leaders in the same day, which is really exciting. Uh, Diane, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, and I'll ask you the exact same question this time around housing all can afford. The Green Party of Ontario recently released their plan, which has been covered by the media, analyzed by policy experts. It's extremely comprehensive. I encourage everyone here to take a look at it. It's excellent. So I will ask you now, um, on the basis of what can the federal government do? What are the, the most impactful things that the federal government can do to help and be complementary to the amazing plan that you and uh, the Green Party of Ontario has put forward? Well, oh, thank, thank you very much, Phil. Um, yes, we've had great response to the housing paper, which is uh, one of the major plans that we'll have about before the next provincial election. I'm working um, now on the climate environmental plan, uh, which will, of course, be complementary to the housing paper. The three big things the federal government could do, uh, actually, I should back up a step by pointing out housing is not a federal government primary responsibility. It's primary responsibility of the provincial government and through them, the, the municipalities. Uh, but the federal government matters enormously. They have the biggest checkbook. They get the largest portion of the tax dollar. Uh, municipalities uh, variously calculated getting maybe seven cents out of every tax dollar in Canada. And so many responsibilities have been downloaded on them, including a lot about housing. So the federal government has the financial power. They also set the major tax rules for the country, which has a huge effect in driving investment. Um, and they also fund a lot of the infrastructure, which in turn drives urban form, which is the biggest factor in our environmental and climate devastation. So um, biggest things the federal government can do, first of all, of course, they should read our paper. But number one, they need to stop making things worse, right? When you're in a hole, which we are on climate and environmental issues, the very first thing that you have to do to get out of the hole is to stop digging. Um, and it, urban sprawl is digging. Urban sprawl is, as I documented in my last report as environmental commissioner, the largest driver of our emissions. It locks people into high carbon lifestyles. Uh, it locks all of us into dependence on imported oil and gas. Uh, Ontario spends, you know, 16 to $25 billion a year just importing fossil fuels. That money that all drains out of the economy doesn't do any of the things that Helen suggested. Um, so stopping the investments that, that subsidize sprawl uh, infrastructure that the federal government does, that's the first thing they have to do. So stop making things worse. Second thing is to reinvest in building sustainable, sorry, well, yes, sustainable, but affordable and supportive housing. So we've had a generation now since the federal and provincial government said, you know, this housing stuff is too expensive we're going to let the municipalities do it. Our partners downloaded all that stuff onto the municipalities without resources and basically said, let the private sector do it. Let the market do it. Well, we've had, we've had a whole generation of that and we've seen it does not work. And even market players who want to build housing that is less expensive and accessible to, for example, um, the lower four tenths of our population, they cannot do it. They can't do it and make money. So if we're going to have housing in our major urban areas that the essential workers can afford, the market cannot do it as we're structured now. It's, it's going to take federal money. And um, so you see in our plan, we looked at what it would cost to provide 100,000 new uh, below market rental units, all of which we have a tremendous demand for, as well as 60,000 supportive housing units, because there are a lot of people in mental distress and with addictions and so on who really need supportive housing, not just housing. So those are two big parts of it that the federal government really needs to reinvest in. 
Um, but of course, most of the population is not in either of those boxes. And for people with average and even above average incomes, we also have problems with not just the cost of housing, the cost of living, the quality of life. So one of the problems that we often have is people think about the cost of housing, thinking only about the upfront price of a house and ignoring everything else. And when you do that, you get drive to run to the conclusion like the, the other parties do, that we should have sprawl. We should just keep building subdivisions further and further and further away on cheaper and cheaper land, subsidize that with everything else we care about and lock ourselves into fossil fuel dependence and give up the farmland we need to grow our food and the wetlands we need to clean the water and to protect us from floods and just keep building. Um, is it actually cheaper even for the families that live there? No, it isn't. Because once you're locked into commuting two or three hours a day, then you're into one or two car families and you're into taking um, a, you know, a lot of your free time is gone because you're sitting in your car. Um, you People, when they become ill and can't drive, they're completely isolated. You end up with very, very high cost for municipalities and environmental destruction that we simply cannot afford. So we know, and this is the Greens are the only party who are looking at the intersection between housing and transportation and health and quality of life. We have to make room for all the people who are coming and growing up. Um, and we cannot expand. We must stop urban sprawl. We must fix our urban boundaries. We must not sprawl anymore. How do we put those things together? Well, it turns out there's a lot of room in urban areas already that we could use much better. Um, City of Mississauga did a study and showed they had room for hundreds of thousands more people um, just basically in vacant land parking lots, badly used land around transit. And so if we focus on building transit and housing together and intensifying the areas we have now, we can give everybody a better quality of life. Get rid we, we have in the GTA the longest, the worst commutes in North America, worse than San Francisco, sorry, worse than Los Angeles, worse than New York, worse than, any, than Houston, worse than any place else that people think of as the, the sprawl capitals, we're it. And the Ford government is turbocharging sprawl, which is, again is going to lock people into longer and longer, dirtier and dirtier commutes, more and more fossil fuel dependence at the very moment when we know we must get off fossil fuels. And you cannot have suburbs without fossil fuels. And we cannot have fossil fuels anymore. So we can't keep building suburbs. So that means we can't, we must, and we can find room for people in our existing urban areas. And in a lot of ways that would make life better. So I don't know if I still have time. So, uh, oh, no, I'm out of time. All right, well, if you get back to me, I can tell more about why else that would be better. That's amazing, thank you so much. I mean, I, I what strikes me about your commentary is how connected housing, the environment and essential work really are. And that connection intersection point is the quality of life within our cities. We need essential workers to keep us safe, alive, fed, we, we need housing to live. And at the same time, we need to do that in a sustainable way that doesn't continue to increase emissions. Um, and I, 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 I can't wait to get into the question and answer period where I'm sure our, our, our audience will have lots of questions on, on how do we do this? How do we make sure we do this? How do we address NIMBYism? How do we address um, uh, the, a generation that is being priced out of the markets? You know? um, and so I, I'm excited to, to, to dive into that as well. Okay, so before we do, I'm going to uh, introduce our, our next panelist. Uh, our next and final panelist is Victoria Reedman. Victoria is a resident doctor in Toronto studying neurology with health systems work on her side. Her interests are in the brain, modern medicine, and the healthcare system. She's also, similar to myself, a Massey College Junior Fellow alum. Uh, and as I've come to learn, extremely, extremely passionate about policy and, and, and how that world can be um, uh, it used to improve the lives of others. So Victoria, I'm gonna ask you, and, and you know, I actually, I should mention everyone that Victoria is coming off of an overnight shift in the ICU. And so we are extremely thankful that she's taken the time to be with us today. Um, and, and so I, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. What do you think are the most important things that the federal government can do to support essential workers? And feel free, of course, to talk about your own experiences, um, which are, I'm, I'm sure, uh, extremely 
personal, real, and 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 and, and vibrant. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, and Diana really loved everything you were talking about. And I was thinking of actually including as one of the suggestions, affordable housing is something that is completely necessary for essential workers because the pandemic, actually, there was a number of PSWs working in long-term care homes, peak pandemic, who were homeless, commuting from shelters to the long-term care homes that were on outbreak. Like it was an absolutely awful situation. I won't dive into that too much more, but essential work and affordable housing, housing is healthcare, housing is essential. Very, very important. Anyway, the pandemic has really been interesting as someone working in healthcare because I never thought of myself as an essential worker. I never really thought about essential work, frontline work. It's all become very mil militarized and being in the middle of that is a very strange phenomenon. Um, but uh, essential work obviously goes so much further than just healthcare. There's, um, we learned actually in society, I think uh, this year in particular, that most essential work, essentially other than doctors, is done by uh, people earning minimum wages, is done in gas stations, grocery store clerks, um, uh, like pharmacy assistants, and the list goes on and on. But there are the people in the society who are the most needed, most valuable, producing the most good, and often the least compensated and the least protected. And the third wave of the pandemic was actually particularly devastating to see because, I mean, it's been devastating all along. The first and second wave, we really saw the people who were dying in the thousands were coming from long-term care homes. And of course, that was devastating in its own right, and people were vaccinated, and that really, really slowed down. And a lot of that comes from issues with essential work in the get-go, that long-term care homes, there's been issues for decades where the people who work there are underpaid, they're understaffed, it's an absolute disaster. Um, but the next wave, the third wave, is when we saw that the people who were dying were factory workers or people going to these large sites and had no sick leave protection. So the first thing that I think I need to talk about is federal paid sick leave. And I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. There was really um, a lot of people died and young people, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and the reason they died is because they went into workplaces where no one had a choice but to show up. They had no protections. And so they would go in sick with COVID symptoms, fevers, coughs. Um, if they had gotten tested, they would have been found to have COVID and they would sp spread it to say hundreds of people within their workplaces. Um, and many of these people ended up in the ICU. Many of these people ended up dying. Even the ones who don't end up dying, the ICU in and of itself, having COVID is such a traumatic experience. And a lot of people weren't prioritized for vaccination. And this came right off the tails of the Ford government um, taking away protections uh, for paid sick leave. And paid sick leave, I think absolutely could be federal. I think it's absolutely essential, uh, pandemic or otherwise. I mean, this has been a really shocking year in terms of um, what the very drastic end of not having these protections looks like. Uh, but on a day to day, like, I think this is like a basic worker human protection right that people deserve. So uh, that would be, I think, the number one thing that that doctors, the science table was also begging the Ford government for. I don't know how many people know this, but I think there was 20 meetings with the science table that happened that said, like, you need to implement federal, like paid sick leave. That is what's going to slow down this pandemic. And they wouldn't. They refused 20 times. And so uh, it just can't ever happen again. So that's number one. <laughs> um, to back up, uh, that one I think is the most centered on the pandemic. But the next thing I want to talk about is, is home care and supports for caregivers. Uh, this is something that before I was in medicine, I think was an issue that I didn't know much about. And I assume that a lot of people don't know a lot about because there's like a whole sector of 
people working and taking care of their loved ones that aren't compensated for it. And it's pretty much invisible work, but extremely important to our system, uh, especially given that our population is aging and uh, and at extremely high rates, crisis rates. That's why we've had so many problems with long-term care or people staying in hospitals for a long time. That's a, a whole separate issue, but they're very interrelated. And caregivers uh, right now, people can get supports through their um, uh, employers sometimes for like time limited caregiving supports. But a lot of times there's people who have to quit their jobs and spend hours of the day caring for their loved ones. Maybe they can't afford long-term care. Maybe their loved one has been on a wait list for long-term care for seven years and they haven't been able to get into it. It's hard to say exactly what happens. Nonetheless, they, there has been caregiver benefits that have been started through the federal government during the COVID pandemic. And this is something that absolutely needs to continue. Um, and in addition to that, the kind of other side of it, is not only do caregiver benefits need to continue for the people who stay home, but home care is also uh, very, very underfunded across the country and has shown to be the cheapest and most dignified way for people to age. Um, and I think Canada is not doing an adequate job whatsoever in implementing systems for people to age uh, and die and whatever else at home, which if you ask almost any aging person is what they want. Um, and is much cheaper and often safer than setting up um, long-term care facilities. And it's something that we try to facilitate as much as possible for people to stay at home, but um, there's limitations on the number of hours of care that people can get. Uh, there's huge amounts of burnout, both within the caregiver population and within the like home care uh, worker population as well. And so their investments into home care pay out huge dividends in quality of life and economic savings for the government um, in like dignified death, dignified aging. And uh, I think that this is one of the key points in healthcare and uh, protect protecting essential workers that I could not stress enough needs to be uh, driven home. And the last thing is just talking about like, I know this is part of your policy package. I found it really hard to pick only three things because <laughs> in addition to you. <laughs> in addition to seniors care, because you know, having adequate home care supports means that more essential workers can be in the workplace working. And it's the same thing for daycare, like daycare supports, extremely economical, great way for parents to be, you know, able to participate in the workplace, creating like economic opportunities, and it's better for kids. Um, there actually was a huge daycare policy. So I decided not to dive too much into this one. But I know you touch on like mental health support for healthcare workers. And I think mental health support can look like a lot of different things. It's been particularly salient this year because this year has been a particularly traumatic year to work in healthcare. Um, it's, I can't, it's hard to describe what it's like to be in the hospital and seeing so many people dying, crashing who you know didn't have to, and then be walking home from work through an anti-mask rally and not understand like how this, could be what is matching up and a lot of the extra so many extra hours so many extra shifts filling in for people if you because if you get a cold you can't come into the hospital at all which makes sense and honestly should have been the case for a long time but it's meant a lot of like filling in the gaps for each other and also like people just being at their wits end with emotionally what they can tolerate in terms of the amount of death um, and devastation that we're seeing for patients, for patients' families. And so uh, a lot of nurses in particular, especially ICU nurses, physicians are choosing to retire, to quit their jobs, to leave. Um, and it's partly because they don't have enough mental health support. It's partly because uh, the hours are just too long, like in an environment that's too traumatic. Um, is partly because there's a lack of, I think, appreciation from governments, at, especially to nurses in the past little while, both Ontario and Alberta, there's been like pay cuts and job cuts, despite the fact that hospitals are like running on their last legs uh, for nursing, and yet these jobs are getting cut uh, and the Calgary Stampede is getting put on. So like there's a, a disconnect between what the reality is of 
not just this pandemic, but the fallout of this pandemic and what the reality is of working in healthcare generally. Uh, and the burnout rates within healthcare are something usually on the order of like 30 to 50%, which is huge as is. And then with the pandemic, the rates have gone up to on the orders of 70 to 90%. So there's definitely mental health supports that need to be addressed, work hour limitations that need to be addressed protections for people working in healthcare, like educational support and encouraging people to go into these fields uh, uh, and with investments along the way and, and just general appreciation coming from the government that isn't backhanded, that isn't, oh, lauding people as healthcare heroes and then kind of slapping them in the face by cutting jobs on a second breath. So uh, I think I will leave it at that, but uh, thank you so much. This has uh, been a really great panel and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Um, I, I should say, you know, essential work is something that's personal to me as well. My fiance is a nurse at SickKids. She works in the operating room. Um, I'm Filipino Canadian and many Filipino Canadians work these low paying but essential roles in factories, et cetera. My dad was a factory worker, is a factory worker in Windsor. Um, he worked throughout the entire pandemic. Um, so I, I, I just want to say thank you so much for, for sharing that. And it was very powerful. And, um, you know, I, I, at least I can personally say if, if I'm ever, if I'm ever privileged enough to be uh, a member of parliament, uh, it's something I will carry with me uh, to every single session. Um, okay, I think we're going to open up the floor to questions. I see that Sam actually has a, had a question around um, uh, around urban sprawl. Uh, and, and so what, we'll, what I'll do is if you'd like to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat or um, raise your hand, whatever you'd like, uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll call on you. So Sam, would you like to just ask your question uh, to the group? It's small and intimate enough that I think we can do that. Yeah, sure. So actually uh, the first part of my question, I just, I pulled up the uh, 2020 vision policy. So I don't, I don't necessarily need to know the uh, tangible things the federal government can do. I can do that on my own time. But I'm wondering, um, are there any examples where we've actually, where governments have actually successfully stopped urban sprawl or at least slowed it significantly? And if so, what policy tools did they use? And then I guess the second part of my question is, if we can't stop that trend, um, it, like some people argue, for instance, I'm thinking of like people like Saul Griffith, uh, that it is possible to still have urban sprawl, but be able to uh, mitigate it through massive spending on electrification, and training of a workforce to support that electrification alongside a clean grid. I'm just wondering sort of what your thoughts are on those two things. One, examples internationally or abroad of success, and then two, if those policy initiatives aren't implemented, uh, you know, what, what then? Um, so first of all, Samuel, I don't know if you know that Toronto used to be successful in stopping sprawl. So there's some fit photos still floating around showing of the Steeles Avenue when it was in the northern boundary of urban development. And on the south side, it was all high rises. And on the north side, it was all farmland. Um, and that was deliberate result of government policy was to not provide the services for residential development north of Steeles. Uh, that was thrown out, as you can tell. So the it, it's definitely a question of, of public policy, urban urban uh, official plans, very important, but making them enforceable. And you know, the Ford government has done a huge amount to weaken the ability of municipalities to hold their urban boundaries um, and not subsidizing the services, the roads, the sewers that make the water systems that make sprawl possible. Those things have been done at public expense and at public harm, but at great private profit. It's a lot like the rest of the fossil fuel industry. The costs are borne mostly by the public and the profits are borne mostly by a fairly small number of people who use that money to buy political power and get the rules set to suit them continuing to do. You can also look at a lot of European cities, which have been in existence for, uh, you know, in cases thousands of years longer than any Canadian city and have managed to maintain at least some of the agricultural land around them. Um, even the famous example of New York City, which bought the farmland upstream in order to protect its water supply. So yes, it can be done, but you have to be serious about it. And it's um, 
we've spent a generation doing the wrong thing and putting more and more and more political and economic power in the hands of the fossil fuel industry and the real estate developers. So changing that isn't easy, but it is essential. Thank you, Diane, thank you. Um, I see that Kate has made a few comments uh, in the chat and uh, Kate, for those who aren't aware, uh, is uh, an advocate for accessible housing uh, and she's very uh, active in the Toronto St. Paul's community. So uh, Kate, perhaps I could ask you to uh, maybe comment or ask a question, perhaps directed to Victoria, since I, I see a lot of your um, comments are on long-term care, if that's okay. Okay, sure. Um, well, one, one of the reasons we advocate for accessible housing is that caregivers are burning out. Now, if you could live in an apartment that was fully accessible, it wouldn't be so difficult to look after your ill um, or you know, aged relative. And on top of that, there's all the PSWs and, and other people who go in to assist people who are trying to live in place. But you really can't have good home care if you don't have a home that's accessible. And, and it's not only a matter of aging in place, it's also your whole families are, are in terrible distress because they have a, a child who has a disability. Um, a, a family member has um, an increasing disability, like my friend I mentioned in, in the chat, who is just in her 40s and she's been sent to long-term care because there is no care and no accessible apartment for her in, in the city. Um, I know somebody who was young and able and working and was hit by a truck when he was out on his bike and he now is is quadriplegic and lost his job and his home and his and his marriage in the process um it, it's just a terrible thing when someone has a disability and we are all one step away from a severe illness or accident that or aging that will make us disabled as somebody who's almost 80 years old i am very aware of this thanks phil thank you kate thank you um, uh, I'll ask Victoria to respond in just a moment, but um, I, I, I know that Diane just messaged me and that she has to leave. Uh, so I'll, I'll thank Diane very much for joining. Um, and if uh, any of you would like to follow up with her or have any further questions, I'm sure she can put her contact information of her office or, or her uh, in, in the chat. Um, yeah, vote for Diane.ca. <laughs> I think that's a good place to start. Thank you, Diane. Okay, uh, Victoria, would you like to maybe respond to, to Kate's comment and, and maybe uh, add a little bit more color to uh, personal support workers and home care? Uh, all I can say is that I completely agree, like accessibility. I don't know how this happens because so far as I understand, there's accessibility codes that buildings are meant to adhere to. And I don't think that it happens. And it's a huge problem for just about every aging person that you can think of, uh, whether it's wheelchair accessibility or getting hospital beds into an apartment building. Like there's many, many, many issues that relate to this. And so all I could say is that I completely agree there needs to be accessible housing. There are too many people that I think could if given the, the right kind of environment and resources, really, really thrive living at home and be so much happier and um, so much safer, more dignified, it would be what they want. It would be cheaper for uh, the country, but it's not happening. And a reason like buildings not being accessible is that's just completely unacceptable. Like it, the buildings need to be held to the standards that I really thought did exist um, anyway. Thank you. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for that. And um, so uh, we're, we're, we're nearing the, near the end here, but I want to uh, see if anyone has a question related to uh, uh, youth and green jobs and growth. I know that there were some, some questions in the chat, but um, uh, I'm having a difficulty scrolling. So it, it, would anyone like to, uh, does anyone have a question around uh, how do we do this transition and what is, will that workforce look like? I guess I just love advice from Helen when you're engaging someone in conversation and you know they're they risk losing their job in oil and gas. Um, what tools do you use in approaching those conversations um, that just make it a more palatable message or for those with family members in oil and gas? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a really important um, part of the conversation and then I struggled not having kind of just transition as like one of my top three because it's it absolutely is up there. Um, Iron and Earth and Climate Action Network Canada do really great work on distilling like what are the core kind of policy changes that do need to happen 
um, in order to support existing workers transitioning into um, into new sectors, because those skills are so transferable is the wild part. Like if you're working um, on an oil rig, you can the the technical skill sets that you have can are almost perfectly transferable into working on um, renewable energy technologies. And so um, I think when it comes, I think there's a messaging part of this. Um, I know the Alberta Narratives Project and Iron and Earth do a lot of work around like, how do we just like bring these this community together and really um, make sure that this is not kind of a message of fear, but this is a message of um, of optimism and those pathways are made available for how you can reskill and upskill and how you can transition into new and emerging sectors. Um, so student energy doesn't do as much directly on this, but we refer to like organizations that are really, really good at doing that. Um, and then Climate Action Network um, Canada has done a lot of work um, kind of promoting just transition policies and a green, a green New Deal for Canada um, to the federal government um, and uh, really distilled some, some highly critical, like hugely critical um, core kind of policy changes that would need to happen to invest in um, in reskilling and upskilling and the growth of sectors where those workers can move can ha kind of have those pathways to move directly into sectors that aren't kind of in a completely different location from where they're working now like really making sure that um, that their their context is like completely taken into consideration when designing those policies so I'm happy to I'll drop a couple of links maybe in the chat here as well for further reading because it's uh, just transition is like so critical and I think honestly is a lot of what um, holds us back from getting more kind of cross-partisan and, and collective, um, like a collective kind of positive movement towards uh, embedding climate action as like a core fundamental value of all people in Canada is this lack of, um, this lack of action on just transition and, and kind of lack of communication on like what a just transition means for Canada and what the federal government is willing to commit to um, when it comes to ensuring, ensuring a just transition. So um, yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Thanks. That's really helpful as I campaign for Phil and canvas for him. It's helpful to have those uh, resources available. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. I would really recommend also reaching out to like Iron and Earth to talk more about this because they're really inspiring to me in terms of the work that they're doing directly with um, oil and gas communities uh, in Alberta. Um, and I think across Canada as well, if I'm not mistaken. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And I, I know that uh, the uh, event was originally scheduled to end at 1245 PM or uh, yeah, 1245. But the, the conversation and the question and answer period was just so great. Um, before we leave, I'm, I'm going to uh, just share an exciting announcement. Um, today, we also launched uh, officially our, our policy book, uh, which are a, a series of policy priorities uh, that I will be running on in the next federal election. Um, you can learn more at phildeluna.com. Of course, they're focused on a just and a sustainable society, on green jobs that leave no one behind, and on housing that all can afford. A part of today's um, discussion was uh, just a primer uh, on, and I couldn't have asked for a better um, discussion on how uh, each of these three areas are connected, uh, intimately intertwined, uh, whether it's green jobs, whether it's housing, whether it's essential work, or all of it. Um, impacts each other. And, and, and this is so true in the community of Toronto St. Paul's as well. So I, I really want to, uh, to thank all of you for joining, to thank the policy team for putting together this amazing booklet, which you can uh, download and read through at your leisure, uh, to thank our panelists uh, for, for attending and, and for being here and taking their time uh, to, to speak to us today about why this is so important. Uh, and to take, thank our events team, uh, Val and Moses, who are on the call, who helped to organize and run just an amazing, amazing event.